Hello and welcome to episode 61 of Linux Downtime. I'm Joe. I'm Hayden. I'm Gary. And I'm Alan. Hello, Alan. Joining us again, helping out uh, when Martin's not here. You were just on Late Night Linux as well. You seem to have a lot of time these days. Yes, I am. Between jobs. So yeah, I've got a bit of time on my hands. Oh, well. Thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. So it occurred to me that all three of you either manage or have managed communities. And so I wanted to pick your brains about that, about how you develop and foster a positive community and keep it productive and how you deal with some of the more difficult elements of it and keep it positive and productive. So Alan, you may as well start. What's your tweet-sized version of how to foster a positive community? Oh, that's really easy. And it's a lesson I learned far too late. And that is get rid of bad actors quickly. Because it's very easy for a community of people who are doing good things, whether it's on open source or anything, really. When you've got a community of doing people doing good things and someone comes along and ruffles feathers and is disruptive, rude, or doesn't follow your guidelines, whether that's you know coding style guidelines or human interaction guidelines or whatever it might be, if you don't let them know that their behavior is not what your expectations are quickly and help them to realign with what your expectations as a project are. And if they still don't and you don't kick them out, then it will actually sour the rest of the people who are on the team. And I think that's something I learned far too late even within Ubuntu and in other projects where we didn't kick people out who were disruptive, negative, and problematic. So ideally, you start by modeling the kind of behavior you want to see. You're open, you're accessible, you are inviting to new members, and you identify other people in the community who are top contributors who are exhibiting those same characteristics. And you elevate them and promote them and help give them a platform. And your community kind of builds around that and sets the tone. And then Like Alan mentioned, when necessary, you remove the bad actors as quickly as possible. So I would definitely agree with all of that. In Pigeon, we have the problem of, historically, we don't maintain contributors. And a lot of that, I think I've mentioned it here on the show a couple of times, is we have a code base that I say is hostile to new contributors. It's a lot of old code, stuff like that. So one of our focuses right now is to go ahead and fix that problem so that we can, you know, continue to get contributors and stuff like that. Because I don't know about you guys, but whenever I like contribute to another project, even if it's just a quick patch or something, but like, if I can't figure out what to do relatively quickly, I just kind of leave it right. Unless I absolutely need it. So that's one of the things we've been trying to do proactively. But again, like I want to echo the sentiments about getting rid of poisonous people as fast as possible. We've had some run-ins with that. We didn't act as soon as we should have stuff like that. And, you know, you learn from those mistakes and you keep going. And building on what Hayden said about, you know, build the community you want to have, the community will reflect reflect what the existing people in the community are doing. And so something that we tried to do in Telegraph recently was be very responsive with pull requests and issues. We would set aside time each week. The team would dedicate chunks of time in order to be on top of those issues and both ends of the issues as well. So like the really old ones that people have forgotten about that have got a bit dusty and crusty and, you know, we really want to revisit them, but they're really old and uh, we really need to take some time to look at, but also the really new ones as well. And the way in which you conduct yourself on those, it's not just a case of saying on the old ones, we can't test this anymore. This is an old release. Please upgrade and, you know, close it and then report another issue if that's that's still the case, which is something that I used to see a lot in Ubuntu because they have so many issues. Try and help them, point them in the direction of what you would like to get out of them and apologize when you mess up and apologize when you've left it too long to, to reply and be polite and be respectful and all those, you know, sensible, normal human interaction things. But if you do that as internal people on the project, other people will learn that pattern and other people will do the same thing. So both sides of the same coin is get rid of the bad people and encourage the good people and set an example of how you want others to behave within your project. And people will very quickly identify 
in the conversations within pull requests and issues and so on and on forums and wherever, they'll quickly identify the patterns and, oh, that's how they are here. And, you know, you can see the opposite gets highlighted on places like Hacker News and on Twitter and stuff when people point to a GitHub issue where a project maintainer is being less than respectful to someone filing an issue. Don't be that guy. It's actually not that hard, but some people are just not suited to it and maybe don't put them in front of a keyboard. I'd argue sometimes the uh, issue reporters will really, really push you, so they don't they don't make it easy. I had one of those recently, and you know you do everything you can to try to work with them. And when they're still blaming you and you're like, I, I found the bug, I fixed the bug, here's the patch. I can't debug your computer remotely, right? And then they're still on you. you uh, what I ended up doing was I locked the issue. What else do you do at that point? So what I've done is kill them with kindness. And, you know, I've had people DM me and say, I have no idea how you have the patience to continue that conversation and how you're continuing to be so nice to that person. You know, he's clearly a prick and <laughs> he's clearly, you know, trolling you and winding you up. And I'm like, okay, well, let's carry on the conversation see if we can, you know, find the actual problem. And sometimes it does turn people around and they realize, you know, actually, yeah, I was a bit unsavory and, you know, you can actually find a solution that everyone is happy with. But it's quite an investment of time to do that. And uh, if you've got a big project that's got high visibility and lots of people are looking at it and trying it and they find the pointy edges and the sharp corners and you get issues. Yeah, you're going to get issues from people who have got a great command of your native language. And then you've got others who just don't and write one line replies. And it looks like they're being terse, but the written word is hard to interpret. You know, there's nuance missing and there's tone missing. And it's, you know, you just have to think about the position that they're in, which is your software's broken. It doesn't work. I would like it to work, but for some reason it's not working. And if you can empathize with that position, it's um, it gets you both in a better place. The main difference here for my recent use case was they were telling me how to design and develop my program. That's the point where it got to. It's like, yeah, like this has been this way for 15 plus years. Uh, that's just the way it works. <laughs> yeah. At Determined, we take a similar approach to what Alan described at Telegraph, where engineering responds to GitHub issues promptly, questions raised on the Slack. And then we also supplement that with open office hours staffed by developer advocates and engineers, where anyone with questions or a problem or an open pull request can actually stop by and talk to an engineer and we will help them get their pull request through or diagnose their problem live. It goes back to openness and accessibility. And, you know, for example, I have my DMs open and even on my uh, link tree linked on a lot of my profiles, I have my Calendly and anyone can schedule a meeting with me, you know, when I'm available. Including marketers and uh, people trying to peddle all sorts. I've seen you tweet about. Yeah, it's happened once or twice, but it's also turned out some really good collaborations. So that goes back to the how you set the tone, how you demonstrate the kind of behavior you want to see, respectful, gracious, patient, like Alan. <laughs> And um, that seems to help define things. And hopefully you, you don't get it into a situation where you're having to invoke the code of conduct and all kinds of things, but it happens. So it's interesting you mentioned code of conduct because that's something we've never had on Pigeon. And it's something we've considered adding a number of times. But the problem is right now, we don't have a very active community. So it's like, all right, this needs to be looked at before it becomes a problem. but it's not a problem, so we haven't looked at it kind of thing. It's a chicken and egg problem kind of thing. It's funny you should mention that. My very last pull request before I left the company was to add a code of conduct to Telegraph um, <laughs> because someone filed an issue and we just nobody looked at it and thought, oh, we haven't got one. And someone filed an issue and said, hey, you haven't got a code of conduct in this repository. And if you name it a particular thing in GitHub, if you name it you know, code underscore of con underscore conduct.md it shows up on the right hand side under the license and you know all that kind of stuff so it's like really it's right there and in your face so you can see it and uh, i went and looked for a commonly used one i uh, tweaked it slightly and did a pull request and that landed 
I think that landed the day I left the company, <laughs> which was quite, <laughs> it was like, see you later. I leave you with this code of conduct. There's a lot of people who don't like codes of conduct. And I personally think the code of conduct in the Ubuntu community was one of the pivotal reasons why the community was so welcoming over and above some other Linux distributions at the time, because most of them didn't have one. And the code of conduct that was, I think it was mostly written by Benjamin Mako Hill, along with Mark Shuttleworth and a few others, right back at the beginning, back in 2004. And it hasn't changed a lot since then. And I know a lot of projects have based theirs on that code of conduct or derivatives of it or reworks of it. I think that was a pivotal part of Ubuntu's success. That and, you know, Mark sending free CDs to everyone. Yeah, and being good. Yeah, the technical there were te good technical reasons why something is good, but that doesn't always make it a success. Uh, yeah, so true. I think I think these other softer issues like the code of conduct were uh, very valuable too. I see a lot of concern about codes of conduct and their potential use for political purposes or other reasons, but really that hasn't been much of a problem. Unfortunately, the people who seem to be most concerned about code of conduct one aren't really contributing anything besides arguing about codes of conduct and are often the reason why you need codes of conduct in the first place. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're the first people you put in the bad actors bucket, <laughs> really. Yeah, we got some pushback. We, told, we were talking about a code of conduct a while ago and people were like, you're going to get people that are just going to be trolling you for adding a code of conduct. And it's just like, yeah, I don't really want to open that can of worms right now kind of thing. Yeah, but then could that weed out some of the people that you don't want in the community? Yeah, yeah. It's a double-edged sword because some people use the code of conduct as a stick to beat people with. And I've seen that in the Ubuntu community. People use it as um, someone will say something and another contributor doesn't agree with that. And the first tool that they get out of the toolbox is to slap them with the code of conduct. And it's like, well, you've kind of hit the nuclear button by doing that. You could have a quiet conversation in DM or you could pick up the phone or have a you know, a jitsy call with them or whatever in order to talk it through rather than escalate all the way up to, you know, code of conduct means getting leadership involved. It means, you know, timeouts. It means, you know, disconnecting you, saying goodbye. There's a lot of smaller steps that you can do before you get to slapping someone with a code of conduct. And I, I do feel that sometimes it gets thrown around as a threat to people. And it really should be the tool of last resort. So I've got a practical question. And that's about fragmentation within communities, because it seems that every person has got their preferred communication platform, whether that is Telegram or Matrix or Discord or Discourse. So how do you deal with that? Do you just pick something and say, you've got to come here, otherwise we're not going to talk to you? Or do you just allow it to become fragmented across several platforms and then try and bridge them somehow with bridges that break all the time? For us, we end up getting fragmented everywhere, but that's kind of our shtick. Yeah. Being a universal client, we just kind of go and meet our community everywhere. So, like, I just recently finally left our Freenode channel because we were still keeping a presence there because, you know, we were there for 15 years or whatever, right? But, like, we also have a very small presence on OFTC, but then we have a Discord server, we have our own XMPP server, we have our website, we have our mailing list. We have our issue tracker. We're, we're basically wherever. There's even a Telegram channel and a Matrix channel that I'm in. Yeah, you really are the poster children for fragmented community. Yeah. By design. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Right, because like, if somebody's only using Pigeon for, I don't know, Telegram, well, where are they going to go to report the issues? On the Telegram channel, because that's the account they have. So like, it'd be great if everybody would use the issue tracker, but we all know users don't always like to create issues because, you know, they don't want to go through the process or whatever. Can't I just DM you on Twitter with my issue? <laughs> I mean, you can, whether or not I have <laughs> enough information to, you know, actually create an issue and find a way to reproduce it and stuff is a whole other story. Yeah, pigeon wouldn't work, Harry. Help me. <laughs> I, I get those quite often, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a few problems here. One is you've identified fragmentation, and I think fragmentation is is not necessarily a bad thing. It's very straightforward to say that the project leadership can say, these are the places where we hang out. If you want to come and talk to us, come here. And you might get a few of them who also hang out on, you know, some WeChat or WhatsApp or whatever the you know weird esoteric places are. But if you say on your website, here are the places you can find us, 
then that's a good signpost. As long as it is well signposted and you can direct people there. I think if people build new tools and have other ways to communicate, there's not a lot you can do about that. You can certainly say, well, we're not there, or that's not our official, in inverted commas, place where we hang out and where the developers hang out. If you want optimal conversation with the developers, come here. But you can't really tell people, no, don't have a conversation over there, because that over there could be discourse. It could be a closed forum where people discuss a particular brand of motor vehicle, or as I discovered, a closed forum where medical professionals go and anyone who's not a doctor can't sign up to that forum. And they've got a a sub forum on there all about Linux. And within there, there's a whole section about Ubuntu. I am never going to be able to see that stuff because I'm not a doctor. And most of the developers will never see that stuff. And so it's the enthusiasts, the advocates who are in there selling your product for you and supporting it for you in that location. You can't really stop them. You can't stop people having a conversation about your product in the pub or in the community center or in the park. Stop trying. Just let people have a conversation wherever they want to and tell them how to find you. I mentioned we have a matrix and telegram and I forget what else. I don't control those channels. Those are community members that set it up. And it's like, I'm just there to observe and help where I can kind of thing because I can actually access it, right? I I don't have to be a doctor to get there. (laughs) Yeah, but the problem with that is if there's an unofficial channel somewhere and people are behaving badly in it, it somewhat reflects badly on you if that channel is about you. I mean, I only know about this from the the show's point of view. You know, there's a a late-night Linux Matrix channel, for example, that I sometimes go in. There's an IRC channel that I was in for a while, and then I don't know what happened And I worry that if people are being dicks in there, it may put off potential community members. And so that kind of is out of my control, and I don't like that, I suppose. Yeah. So what you can do is you can speak to the people who do run it and either say, hey, can you put something in the title that says unofficial Mm. that actually signposts the official place? Yeah. And that's one way to say, well, if anyone turns up here, You know, we all know everyone, as soon as they join an IRC channel, they all read the topic thoroughly and they click all the links (laughs) and read all the documentation thoroughly. I know they don't, but at least it's there and you can say, well, read the slash topic or the pinned post or whatever forum it is. You should be able to communicate with whoever runs the place to say, hey, look, it's adversely affecting me. It's potentially harming our brand. Please, could you add a disclaimer that this is unofficial and the best place to find people is over there? That's a great in concept. I've had experiences naturally where that's not the case, where you contact them and they're like, piss off. Nice. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I don't doubt there are people like that. Some people like to build their little fiefdoms and it's their little town that they are the mayor of and you can all bugger off because this is mine and, you know, you're not putting a sign on my signpost. This is my signpost. So, yeah, you. I mean, you can work around people like that. Well, we'd better get out of here then. Thank you very much for joining us, Alan. It's been great. Uh, two in a row for you helping me out here. So thanks for that. No worries. Anytime. Ah, well, I might hold you to that. Uh-oh. I'll have to see. <laughs> and uh, do let us know what you think about all of this community stuff. As a community member or a leader yourself, you can email us, show at linuxdowntime.com. We'll be back in two weeks. But until then, I've been Joe. I've been Hayden. I've been Gary. And I've been Alan. See you later. <laughs>